Good evening all, I'm Aditi Lama with the Thursday night edition of South Asian News, Vision of Asia. We are coming to you from our studio in New York City. Welcome again to our presidential election 2020 special with now President-elect Joe Biden declared as the winner of the 2020 presidential election. But before that, let's take a quick look at the coronavirus pandemic, which is surging all across. Globally, we are looking at more than 52.3 million COVID-19 cases with at least 1.3 million deaths. In the United States, we have surpassed 10.5 million cases with almost 242,000 deaths. This is a fall surge impacting the whole nation, especially the Midwest and the Sun Belt. The sheer number of infections is driving hospitalizations to record levels. The state of California is on its way to become the second state in the U.S. to surpass 1 million COVID-19 cases. Remember, Texas surpassed that number yesterday. Health experts worry that this will get worse before the upcoming holidays. All states are seeing a rise in hospitalizations, ICU admissions and ventilator use, while some hospitals have already reached full capacity and are sending patients away. Doctors all across the nation are pleading to the public to take coronavirus seriously and mask up, wash your hands, and practice social distancing. Also, today's nation's leading health expert, Dr. Fauci, said that the pandemic won't be around a lot longer but probably won't eradicate and said that public health officials may need to maintain control chronically over COVID-19. Meanwhile, looking at politics and election 2020, the Trump administration is currently blocking President-elect Biden's transition team from getting access to classified briefings as President Donald Trump continues to refuse to concede and allegedly has called for voter fraud. So how does this impact the South Asian voice and where are we going ahead with this transition process during COVID-19 surge across the nation? We speak with doctors, journalists, and the community on this tonight and much more. Here are the headlines. Dr. Anush Vora discusses alarming rise in coronavirus cases, updates and measures, Connecticut. Jagannath Slik Dasur on presidential elections 2020 and the South Asian Americans, New York City. Federation of Indian Associations Tri-State organizes Diwali 2020 Soup Kitchen, New Jersey. Time for a short break. Stay with us on Vision of Asia. Watch the community. We'll be right back. And welcome back, I'm Aditi Lama and this is Vision of Asia Thursday night episode of South Asian News. We continue now to present updates on this very crucial 2020 presidential election results and the path moving forward. President-elect Joe Biden is moving forward with his transition plans and has named a longtime aide as his incoming White House Chief of Staff, Mr. Ron Klain. President Donald Trump continues to not concede and has denied the president-elect access to classified briefings and federal funding necessary to set the Biden-Harris incoming administration up for success in its first 100 days. This has come to a point where even GOP senators are stepping in. This is happening while the Trump campaign continues to file lawsuits in several battleground swing states where president-elect Biden has won. And meanwhile, America's closest allies, world leaders, have all acknowledged Biden's victory, including Prime Minister of India Narendra Modi, who tweeted that he looks forward to working closely together once again with Joe Biden to take India-U.S. relations to a greater height. So how does all this impact South Asians and how should we be analyzing this election result? We spoke with the founder of Jagannath, Snigda Sur. We are talking about this historic election which just took place and we're still trying to deal with what's happening. So let's dig right into it, Snigda. My first question to you has to be, what has been your and your team's reaction to this entire historic cycle of election? How was it covering it? 
Yes. I, I mean, it was so important covering it. it uh, many of our, um, people on our team and our reporters didn't really even think that in our lifetimes we'd see somebody of Asian American descent, we'd see a woman vice president, we'd see someone of black descent become vice president. Like these are all these first that Kamala Harris just broke through in terms of barriers. So in terms of reporting on it, we knew immediately as soon as she was even running for the presidency that she was someone to follow. So that I think was definitely established from the beginning. What made it interesting that once she was announced on the ticket, we still continued reporting on her. And what our reporters are finding in the field, obviously, is there are so many mixed emotions at the same time. So many people are so excited to see her. And it's true. She said she, you know, she won't be the last. She might be the first, but she won't be the last. And so many young women, you know, non-young women are so excited to see somebody like her at the second highest position in political office in the US. Right. At the same time, our reporters also found a lot of other reactions, right? Because when you spend a long time in history, as Hillary Clinton's candidacy showed, and maybe because she's also a female politician, you're just held to a higher standard. Kind of all, your entire history is really looked at with the magnifying lens. Um, a lot of past records are looked at. And at the same time, you know, there have been moments where she has had a few gaffes in both the Black and the Indian community. So that's been kind of interesting to, to report on as well. How do you think South Asians reacted to the Biden-Harris ticket, according to you, with whatever information you were able to gather? So, you know, it's great because we also looked at this amazing Carnegie uh, survey called the Indian Attitudes, Indian American Attitude Survey. This survey in, uh, surveyed about 936 Indian American citizens in the U.S. right before the election. And what the survey found was that 49 percent of those respondents actually were more enthusiastic about the Biden and a ticket after he selected Harrison as his vice president. And the number one reason among those 49% for why they were more enthusiastic about his presidency was because she was uh, you know, of Indian origin. And so there is a change and there was a change that happened in the entire candidacy because of that ticket and because of that pick. Yes, definitely. You know, let's talk a little bit more about this historic election again. I would like to know how was it covering the battleground states? Because at the end of the day, it all relied on those four states, you know, Pennsylvania, Georgia, Arizona, and Nevada. What were some of the discoveries you and your team found? Yes. So when you think about those um, you know, sometimes they're called swing states, sometimes they're called the states that had very, very small margin of victory. Right. One of our reporters specifically is actually from the Philadelphia area, and she went around and spoke to what she called a lot of aunties and uncles, as well as the young folks from Pennsylvania. And it's interesting because ahead of time, people already kind of knew from the 2016 results that Pennsylvania would be very, very important. And you've seen also this kind of uprising of tons of grassroots organizations created by South Asians, also affiliated with the South Asians for Biden campaign that were really out there canvassing, campaigning, phone banking to get the vote out there and to also you know, get people to register, to get people to kind of show up to vote, to you know, let people know about mail-in ballots, to let people know about policies and from both kind of sides of the aisle, from both the Republican and the de Democratic side. So I think it was really important at all of those states for all of those efforts to happen. Right. And I think when you think about those campaigns, so many people are realizing that you know the electoral college is not necessarily a flawed system, but it is partly sometimes an outdated system, which means that certain states matter much more than you would think. When you look at the South Asian American population, most have settled in a lot of the Eastern or Western regions or a lot of the cities. And so what you're increasingly seeing is that states that are like Georgia, which have Atlanta, or states like Pennsylvania, which have Philadelphia, increasingly have South Asian American voters, and they could be you know, swinging the elections. On this coming weekend, more than a billion people around the world will be celebrating Hindu Festival of Lights Diwali 2020. Considered the start of New Year, the festival commemorates the victory of good over evil, light over darkness, symbolizing positivity in life and more. It is marked by celebrations which includes religious prayers, fireworks and a grand display of Indian cultural heritage and its recent years have seen massive events even here in the United States. But with COVID-19, this year Diwali will be more intimate and celebrated with just immediate family members away from any large gatherings. So to honor the festival and give back to the community during this festive occasion, the Federation of Indian Associations, FIA Tri-State, collaborated with Hands of Hope for a Diwali drive-in soup kitchen in Edison, New Jersey.
The aim for the event was to give food items to community members in need due to COVID-19 ramifications and to bring a sense of unity during this tough time. The event also saw the support of Indian Consul General of New York, Mr. Randhir Jaswal. Here is the story. Wave Beats Music I would not say just a delight but a privilege because what I see here and what I soak here is service to humanity. There is no force which is stronger than service for humanity. Today, this particular event happening under the banner of FIA during the Diwali celebration, on the occasion of Diwali celebration, it gives us so much of joy and happiness because this festival is about sharing with our near and dear ones and sharing with people around us. So I'm so happy and delighted and honored and privileged that I'm in part of this service to humanity. Thank you FIA for this wonderful initiative and event. You have our all support. Today, it's an uplifting day for me. It's, I'm very encouraged and very thrilled. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody. What a beautiful summer, it seems like a summer day, sunny day. And we are, we are here um, in what we call FIA soup kitchen, where we have a whole bunch of volunteers. We are serving fresh food to the needy in the Middlesex County at this church. And uh, we are very fortunate to have um, our, our, our Council General Sri Jaiswalji with us. Uh, FIA started this year this Diwali soup kitchen concept where we are uh, feeding 10,000 needy people ma mainly in tri-state area as well as in India. And we are so happy that today our CG, Honorable CG, Jaiswal Ji, could make it here. We are so, so thankful to them. And as you can see, we are uh, giving out our food to our clients today. And thank you for the organizations that have uh, donated, you know, to make this day possible. Uh, and if it wasn't for all the organizations who help us, we would never be able to provide the food. Uh, today we, we are providing, you know, a bag full of uh, all kinds of non-perishable food items. We have an organization from East Brunswick who drops off all kinds of perishable foods and we bag it them in the morning and we'll give them out to the, to the residents. And then uh, we have the organization who donated our lunch and we're giving everybody a hot lunch today, which we haven't done since March. I want to uh, congratulate uh, Hands of Hope, uh, Charles Tamaro and the team, Kathy, uh, and all the volunteers who are doing a wonderful job of uh, serving hot meals. Uh, FIA is sponsored here. And, and as you see, it's a very happening, successful drive. And I think we have, we, we're serving the community, proud to be part of Edison. Uh, I've been raised here and it's, uh, my hometown uh, that I love so it's uh, an added pleasure to to give back and to to volunteer in the community activity and and I want to be thankful to all the volunteers and all the donors who have uh, done a wonderful job uh, of helping out uh, as you see uh, as uh, right now we have 200 meals ready to serve and uh, about 200 uh, packed uh, dry uh, cold meals if you would or, or packaged food uh, and and I think uh, with this, uh, we are going to reach a new uh, collective milestone uh, for, for FIA's Diwali Soup Kitchen Drive, for which I thank all the sponsors. Federation of Indian Association has started the Diwali Soup Kitchen to support in this pandemic. And we all know Diwali uh, is for just giving the happiness, to spread the happiness, and Federation of Indian Association has taken a great initiative to spread the happiness throughout this pandemic. So we are very happy and we'll come keep continue doing this amazing work for the community. Basically what I do is supervise the, um, or help coordinate the people that pack the bags for us on there. Um, every week we come in, we have a group that comes in and packs them so that they're ready for the next time that we're open and um, 
order food if we have to or sort the food when um, it comes in, donations we get. On there, I also pay the bills from the money that's donated. And it's time for the short break. Stay with us on Vision of Asia, Voice of the Community, Election 2020 special. We'll be right back. And welcome back. This is Vision of Asia, the South Asian news segment, and I am Aditi Lamba. We are looking at now the coronavirus pandemic. More than a dozen U.S. states have doubled their COVID-19 caseloads in the last 14 days as the pandemic spreads relentlessly across much of the country. It's impacting currently the Midwest and the Sun Belt the worst, but COVID-19 cases increase has been felt everywhere. These cases hit an all-time daily high for a second day in a row, hitting more than 142 cases and an alarming number of hospitalizations at more than 65,000. Officials in several states, including New York, California, and hard-hit hotspots in the Midwest reimposed restrictions to try to stem the spread of the infection as winter looms and people gather indoors more, heightening the risk of the contagion. Meanwhile, vaccine developers have offered some good news this week with Pfizer and BioNTech successfully early data coming in from a large-scale clinical trial of coronavirus vaccine and shows a 90% efficacy. So how does this impact the spread of coronavirus? And how should we be protecting ourselves from the very concerning second wave of coronavirus? Earlier today, we spoke with ER doctor Anuj Vora, urging all to wear a mask and maintain social distancing. Here is Dr. Vora. So much is happening in the nation and we are seeing a great rise in cases and hospitalizations as we speak. So let's go right into it, Dr. Vora. I am looking at more than 10 million cases here in the United States with at least 242,000 deaths. Globally, we're looking at 51 million cases with at least 1.3 million deaths. How are you as a doctor, as an ER doctor, processing these numbers? It's huge. It's a huge number. And what we're seeing in the United States is it's getting worse. Um, the numbers continue to rise. We're continuing to see spiking throughout the country. Um, and it's going, this is uh, the second round. You know, it never really went away, but things did calm down for a little bit. And now we're seeing the second wave that we expected. Um, as you mentioned, we're seeing over 10 million cases now. We're also going into flu season. And I think the expected uh, growth of this disease will continue, uh, unfortunately, uh, over the next month or two. Uh, we're hypothesizing that November, as we're seeing an increased growth, we'll continue to see a high spike into December. Um, and then we'll see what happens from there. And hopefully by January and February, things start to calm down again. Here are the challenges. Yeah. The first round, we had a ton of COVID cases, but most patients, most people stayed home. Hospitals were busy in their ICUs and their EDs didn't see a tremendous volume. In fact, we saw a pretty significant drop in volume because most people were not using emergency departments. They were staying home. Now, with the flu and respiratory illnesses and COVID on top of it, we're seeing a significant rise in volumes versus first round in emergency departments. And that's gonna to lead to a lot of challenges um, because there's only so much space and only so much capacity we have. Regardless, if you have symptoms of significance, meaning shortness of breath or significant chest pain, things of that nature, you need to be seen in your local emergency department or by your physician, okay? The most devastating Ill issues and complications we're seeing with COVID illness is hypoxia, which is low oxygen level. So most patients will stay in the hospital or go to the ICU based upon that. Now, there are many other things that you can have with COVID. You know, the symptoms are very similar to the flu. Brain nose, cough, congestion, body aches, weakness, abdominal pain, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, so many symptoms. But having COVID is one thing. Having a significantly clinical COVID is another. So if you're unsure of what you've got and you have symptoms, you should certainly get checked. But just be mindful that you may not be kept in the hospital, which is a good thing, unless you really need to be there. And most of the time is based upon your oxygen levels. Yes, definitely. You know, I would like to discuss these numbers, Dr. Vora. Yesterday, we reported 144,000 new cases and there were more than 65,000 hospitalizations. Um, does that number make sense to you? And have you started to see that increase in the two ERs that you direct? 
Uh, well, you know, as you can see, I'm wearing scrubs today. My white coat, I literally just finished uh, a shift in the ER. And my last patient was a COVID patient with bilateral pneumonia, meaning pneumonia in both of their lungs from COVID. Um, so we're certainly seeing an uptick in our facilities and both of the EDs in our entire system of 11 hospitals with an increase in COVID patients. Yes, uh, we're feeling it in the state of Connecticut and we're seeing it nationwide. Um, it is unfortunate, and what's what's even scarier is that the uptick in cases is even higher than our first go around. I think part of that is because of the recognition earlier of illness with all the education we've been doing and all the testing we're also doing. Because remember, if we're testing more, you're going to have more positive patients. But in actuality, they are true numbers of significance, and they are much higher than round one. Yes, definitely. You know, currently we are seeing a rise in the Midwest and the Sun Belt and certain parts of the south of this country. You know, in the beginning of this pandemic, when we look back at the months of March or April, it was us who were the epicenter. We had the most number of cases. You know, states like New York, New Jersey, Connecticut, Pennsylvania saw the worst. Do you think we all have to prepare for something like that here Cases are surging on a different side of the country right now. How much is this going to impact us in the coming months? Um, it's impacting us now. I think we all need to prepare for the second round. And if you're living in the tri-state area or an area that had a high surge that's calmed down, um, it will only stay low if people are careful and wearing their masks and keeping a social distance. Um, you'll see on any given day, you may have a 1.6% rate of COVID in your area, and the next day you may have a 6% surge. In fact, the state of Connecticut went from a phase three COVID plan back to a phase two. And you may see that in other areas throughout the world where they may have had a implementation plan of different models for COVID. I mean, phase one is all indoor restaurants shut down and you know very limited restaurant takeouts available and, and, and certain hours of operation for certain industries you know phase two loosened up so when i use phase one phase two phase three i mean phase one is pretty much complete lockdown phase three is almost opening up to normal operation um and we may be stepping back from that as we already did in connecticut you may start to see the other areas of the country in different parts of the world so to answer your question completely is mm -hmm. Just if you live in a safe area, you still need to take every precaution possible because you're seeing the surge in other areas. Yeah. Um, and it can certainly circle back to you or as it is to us. So yes. we're definitely not in the clear. Mm -hmm. uh, as you, you know, you, I'm sure you, many of your watchers know uh, there is a COVID vaccine that's on the way, mm -hmm. but we're still not there yet. Um, it's not released as of yet. Uh, we do have some new therapies that we're trying for COVID patients, um, specifically for those patients that have significant illness from COVID. Um, but, you know, again, those are, um, those are some options, but not a cure yet. Here is the community highlight now on preparations for Festival of Flies, the Pavli 2020 in New Jersey.
Well, that is all for tonight's show. Remember to send us your suggestions and get your voices and organizations on our show. Email us on events at itvgold.com or follow us on Facebook at ITV Gold. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel to watch many of our popular shows for free. Thank you for joining us tonight. From Queens, New York, this is Vision of Asia. And I am Aditi Lamba. Take care and be well.